Welcome to Seeds for Our Future, Conversations and Explorations. Today we'll be speaking with Helen McCarthy, who resides in Western Australia. Helen has been channeling for 20 years, initially for herself with a terminal cancer diagnosis, having lost the use of both legs with a broken spine and unable to move unassisted, she relentlessly sought answers. During the three months confined to her hospital bed, her team taught her to tap into the intelligence of her body and trust her intuition. With step-by-step instruction, she began a dialogue with her cells and defying all medical prognoses, walked away healthy and whole. Helen guides others around the world and, and is an old friend. Welcome, Helen. Um, you want to t- start talking to me about the global transformation? Absolutely. And this comes from both the 20 year longitudinal study that my community is involved in here in Perth and also from the channeling that I've done, particularly over the last 12 months. What my team that I channel is saying is that we have exceeded critical mass. Mm. It's not that um, we've reached a number that is going to be transformational. I think that will come in this year. But what they describe this year to be is the year of transformation. They are saying, all your life has been lived for this year. This is why you're here. This is the year that is your year. So what I come to understand from that is that the escalation in in the numbers of people who are aware and awake, um, who understand that we're taking the planet and its people on a new trajectory will increase and compound this year. So it's us, the humans, who are doing the heavy lifting work. And they describe it as within us, there is a technology that came in built with those of us who have a dark circle around the iris of the eye. So if you have a look at your eye, there's a dark circle around the iris. Hmm. And what that means is that although the, the the old seven chakra system are still operational in terms of bringing light into the body, We've moved to using the skin as a vehicle for light transmission. And as soon as we did that, every skin cell, and our skin being the largest organ of the body, began bringing light in in such great proportions that it began to change us internally, Meg. So within us there is a change going on. And that change is quite spectacular. We can't see it, but we can at times feel it and the symptoms tell us that there is changes going on. The most remarkable thing is we have somebody here who's a very high profile integrative doctor and she uses iridology to determine the health of the body. She also has the gifted ability to be able to see geometric patterns that change when the light that we're channeling into us changes its frequency. Hmm. And what she saw this year was that our nervous system always had worked independently, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, the central nervous system, the enteric nervous system had all worked independently. They were units of intelligence that worked without the other this year or last year actually i'm still talking 2020 here last year they all worked in unison for the first time that she has ever seen in her 40 50 years of uh practice and everyone i can't say everybody at this point because we don't know what she, t- what she tells us is the speed of light that's moving into the human body. And at that speed comes codes of information that the body actions. So if you've had 
periods last year of tiredness and exhaustion, feeling like you can't function, that it was really difficult to, to get up and be the human that you knew you'd always been, then yes, it's very likely if you've had those symptoms that you're in this part of the process. Well, it's very interesting. Last year also, I discovered that I have a blood mutation and I've thought a lot about mutation and DNA changing over the years. So I, yeah. thought, I thought it was really bizarre, but I haven't been able to get any, you know, kind of mm, spiritual information about it. It's just, it's something that I have to attend to. Otherwise I'm likely to have a stroke. And the thing is, you can talk to all your cells. So what I do with clients, and I'm teaching a, a program called Cell Yoga, because the real yoga is unseen, what you do internally with yourself. And we bring our cells to a broad meeting and we get a, a full agreement with all our cells. And at that point, you change the operating system of the body because you, the being that inhabits the body, becomes able to direct the body from within. And so once you get a, a com complete yes, which when it happened to me, that was the, the change point for the paralysis repair that I had. So with two paralyzed legs, the doctor was like, you never walk again. Well, as soon as I got a, a unison yes from my body and asked them if they would work with me to repair um, the glute muscles that were stopping me from weight bearing, I was able to stand up within weeks. So I know from my own experience that you can, in fact, guide the, the physical material of the body and change it. Mm. And I, I do it this very simple way. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. And so I've, I've kept trying to see how to do it, but I, I didn't put all my attention on it, I must say. <laughs> there were more spectacular things to worry about. <laughs> It was a spectacular year, wasn't it? <laughs> so um, to my first question about the seeds that you think we need to plant for the collective change. From what I've channeled and from what I've seen, those seeds are already sprouting. Hmm. So I don't know that there's any seeding to Done other than the hard work which is to keep each one of us who are part of the collective stable centered and emotionally solid because that enables you to take your next steps in your evolutionary process in 2009 I channeled these couple of sentences that I'd really like to, to read so they said you know, you are the technicians who came to change humanity so that the entire human race could be prepared for the shift. And the shift is upon us. And so the hard work has been done by the many spiritual workers over the last 20 years. And I believe that in solidarity together and being complete it with faith in ourselves, we will take that beyond critical mass this year. So that's very, uh, that's very encouraging. <laughs> it is very encouraging, yes. <laughs> um, all the people you work with, I, I wanted to ask you about practices, you know, all these things of being stable and centered and resilient and, and so on. Do all the people you work with come with a different skill set and just do it? Do they need help? What do you see about that? Because I, that's where, that's what I'm writing about. And that's where I see people flailing. They have good, good dreams. And, and some people have practices and really do them, but a lot of people fall by the wayside and they can't kind of maintain. Well, it goes back to my understanding of when you transcended 
the seven chakra system and switched the skin on as your vehicle for light. You did that in one of three ways. You either did it like I did it with a, a physical event or you did it through your emotional body or you did it through your mental body. Mm. So that determines how I work with somebody because I work out from their personal history if physical illness is a repetitive pattern or if emotional instability is a repetitive pattern or if mental instability, which usually goes with emotional instability, a regular pattern in their life and through their life. So I work with them differently. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you see the, the, the method that they've used? Are you just able to see so that? The tools, tools are similar. The, the tools are similar, but how you apply them becomes slightly different for those who have emotional and mental fault lines. Let's call them that because we inbuilt those fault lines before we arrived here because we, we were chosen to do this work. So anybody listening to this, we were all chosen. We chose ourselves and we came here to do this work of Resilience is a great word, Meg, because we were the ones who offered the thrust to the planet so the planet can do the work for the rest of them, for the rest of humanity. But we were the fuel. We were the propulsion. We came in and did it the hard yards first. So the tools are really simple and they're mostly the connection with the cells of your body. Like, Somebody phoned me recently in quite some anxiety. And I said to this person, let's get you back into flow because then all your answers will come. And so the tools of getting her back to flow were really simple. They're self-generating frequency tools. Like in this moment where you're in a state of anxiety, What's the colour that the cells of your body require to bring you into a state of peace, settlement within yourself? And the person always knows. And then the first step is to bring that colour either through breath work or through seeing the crown of the head open and the colour, which is a live frequency. It's simply identifying which frequency the body is calling for for bringing you back into a, a centered state, the body always knows. But by bringing that color through the cells of the body and letting it do its work and having the cells encouraged to embed that color, and when all of them do that, there is a physical change in the body. So all the tools that I use are internal tools. That's very interesting. You you taught us that however many years ago it was, eight, year, eight or nine years ago, um, and I use it occasionally. I didn't quite understand the whole um, surround of, of what it meant, but it's always been fascinating to me that, that the um, colors vary so much. And I yeah. often put them in my body and then I send them into the earth. And I, depending mm -hmm. on how much energy I have, I send them out as far as I can. <laughs> but I should have done that today because I had a very heavy heart. <laughs> Oh, and it was hard to get out of it. <laughs> it can be, can't it? Yes, very. The hardest thing is to remind yourself that you've got the tools to be able to do this when you're in that state. Yeah, when you're in that state, it takes, I mean, today it took me hours to sort of climb out. It was like being in a deep well. Definitely. Yeah. Well, bringing a frequency of color into the body is akin to using medicine. When you look at herbal medicine, every vibration of a herb has a colour because it's come from a plant that has an inherent frequency which the colour can be translated to colour, just as sound can be translated to a colour. All the homeopathics have a colour frequency. If you have a pendulum, you can douse what colour your homeopathic remedies are and what spectrum they sit in. So what you're doing is bypassing the, the intellect and asking the human body in this moment, what color is it 
which is going to bring us into a stable state. And the body always knows. It's an easier process than reaching for the rescue remedy. Hmm. Um, is there a particular, I, I know about frequencies and I work with them sometimes, but I don't have a very good hmm, mental understanding. I don't make the connections very well. Like when you're talking about color has the frequency and so on. Um, is there a particular piece, a, a, you know, book or something that you would recommend? Because I, I would like to learn more about that. Any of the old chakra books will teach you about the, the frequencies of each chakra colors, Meg, which is basically the rainbow. So you've got red, orange, yellow, which are the mag is the magnetic spectrum. We are magnetic electrical beings. So the magnetic part of us is the, the base chakra, sacral, solar plexus. So that's the, the, and then we get to the heart, which is green. And the green is the band pass because in physics you need a band pass to be able to assimilate two different spectrums. So from the, the throat, which is the, the uh, blue, uh, indigo and violet, that spectrum is our electric spectrum from the heart up. So the heart at the band pass is the, the frequency that assimilates the magnetic and the, the electric spectrum. And really, the less you know about colour, the better you are at bringing it through your body because there's no intellectual process. Right. No, that, well, that, no, that works really well for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing, you know, my work has been mainly been with earth-based medicine and uh, it's the same there it totally bypasses your mind so you don't have to go into all these perambulations about what's the matter you just exactly <laughs> exactly exactly we get so caught up in learning information which then kind of trips us up because our intuition isn't always aligned with that information and our intuition has all our answers. It's having the faith that we we are our own source of information. Right. And that that's a really big struggle in our society right now. Oh, huge. I mean, that's, huge. What, that's, the, that's the conflict in America right now. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. The people want to hold on to the external authority and, you know, whether it's Trump or the the church and the patriarchy and all that stuff and it's it's so unconscious for most people that i'm always trying to talk about it because anybody with any brains if they see oh there's this worldview and then there's this worldview it's, it makes it easier to choose whereas if we look at our own intuition and look inward and ask ourselves how do we want to live going forward what is going to bring us joy? Because what's going to bring each of us joy will bring those around us joy as well. And so find an image of what that looks like to you. Everybody's image is going to be different, but we're all parts of a transformation in progress right now. And when we put all those jigsaw pieces together, what you've got is the foundation of a transformational world where we have a beginning point because so many people who have the courage to trust their intuition have already identified the role that they're going to play and can step into it. We are the ones who will bring about a new world. I, I, I've suspected for a long time that you draw people like that to you. Who, I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. And I don't, I don't know if it's Australia or what, but I know a lot of, you know, spiritual groups and blah, blah. And there's not, I have not run into people who are really clear about this very much. A few, but, but some. It's, so it's, it's, uh, do you have any opinions? You've been researching the U.S. <laughs> Maybe you've learned. <laughs> I, I have been researching the U.S. because I'm fascinated because you know if if 
whichever direction the US goes in, Australia will go in that direction too. So, you know, I, I have um, such faith that what will occur for you in the next three to four weeks will be a pivotal change for Western civilization, and in fact, the global community as we know it. And yes, we are very lucky to be here on the west coast of Australia, mm. very lucky. Other than for two months where we were in lockdown, we've lived normal lives. Our beaches, our parks opened up, our cafes opened up. We've never been requested to wear a mask. Really? Uh, yeah, our borders were closed down. We've lived a regular life wow. while everybody else hasn't. Yeah. And I do, the, I do, I do think that... Hmm? Is that true of Eastern Australia too? No. No. Oh, okay. Because that's where we get more of our news from. Yes. Uh, on the south coast of the east, the southeast coast in Victoria, they have a premier who is um, running the state along socialist principles. So you probably hear a lot about that. Well, I read The Guardian, so I, I, and I don't really tune into the politics too much, frankly. I tune in more to the indigenous stuff and the nature stuff and, you know. Yes. And there's a, there's a change over on our land in leadership with the indigenous right now too really good in western good australia <laughs> <laughs> in western australia two of our um wonderful indigenous leaders passed in the last six months um one that i worked closely with and i, and I miss her a lot but she does talk to me um but the event at uluru you would be aware of that. Um, if you tap into Stephen Strong, I think his website is called, I can't remember, but he was there and he spoke about the discordance with the people who were there and the groups and the, the various viewpoints that prevented a full, um, healthy ceremony from taking place there but was a lot of ceremony didn't take place it so. did take place but not in the way that it was uh suggested that it would from the beginning it was held on land that was offered to the group he describes it as it was a football field it was near a toilet block and they were only allowed to use this particular land uh, the rock was, the Uluru National Park was fixed off. They were not allowed near it. So there was a great discordance. Hmm. How many people were involved in that? Because I read about it and was, you know, tuning in in a kind of support way, but didn't really follow up on it. I, I can't tell you, Meg, how many people were there, but there was a lot. Hmm. So besides intuition, are there any other qualities that you feel people really need to develop for as we shift our consciousness and bring forth this awakening? Self-trust. Rest? And that's trust. Self-trust. Self-trust. Because if you can tap into your intuition and you can faithfully hear it, know it, follow it, take action from it, then that immediately gives you a sense of appreciation of self. And what I've been channeling last year is that self-appreciation has a higher frequency than love. Hmm. And when you think about it, if you appreciate who you are and you are confident with your intuitive abilities and those intuitive abilities are vast i mean they they are as unique and different as every human on the planet but when you are living life through your intuitive abilities and you're comfortable and secure in doing that then what you emanate out to others is appreciation of self 
And that's how others come to understand that they can do what you do, that you ca they can also live this life because they see you doing it. Isn't it how everything works? When you're yeah. around somebody who's clear, you see that you can be clear when you're around somebody who's has incredible equanimity you can do that when you're around somebody who's joyful you exactly yeah exactly because you see them expressing it and you know that it's humanly possible so you go well, why aren't i doing that i can do this too yeah yeah so do you um are you are you familiar with the word or the term spiritual activism or does that resonate with you? I, I think I lived it last year in the channelings that I did with the group because we were asked to do some very unusual things, things that I would never, and, and that's why I haven't shared the channeling from last year because it's, it's really outside the parameters of what you would call spirituality. We were asked to, to parallel with the alliance that are working in countries around the world to bring about um, a replacement government. We were asked to create a new grid. They said, we've never in the history of speaking to humans ever asked humans to do this, but you sit with high vibration. So we're going to ask you to cre create a grid. And this grid will assist those who are not awake to awaken because the frequency underneath their feet is going to wake them up. So we want you to create a new grid. We go, okay, so give us the instructions and we'll do it. And we were working from a building that was quite close to our Swan River that runs through the city. And after we'd created the grid, they said, okay, so now put it in the river and let the water take it to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And we saw it. Each one of us in the circle saw it differently, but that's exactly what's meant to be. No two of us were to see it in the same way. And for me, I felt this push as I thrust this grid towards Southeast Asia and others had other experiences at the same time. So what we're doing was actually changing the frequency of the planet. Is that within your parameters of spiritual activism? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, yep, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, people use different terms, but it's not uh, its not that commonly discussed. There's, no. There's a, a, I just took a short course on spiritual ecology, and I took it because oh, I, yeah. I pretty knew, much knew what it was, but I wanted to see what they said and how they did it and who showed up. And the most fun thing was that all the, we had a lot of breakout sessions with four or five people and at first they gave these long prompts and people were supposed to read them and you know talk but after the first meeting people saw how valuable it was so everybody just talked <laughs> and you know because they were everyone yearns to have more people to share these important things with and most people don't have that we don't have that i'm so grateful to us have the gifts that I have to be able to build a network here. And basically what they're saying to me, and I, I have no idea quite how I'm going to do this, is that they want to expand the work that we've done in Perth to other countries because they said when you stand on the land, which you would know from spiritual ecology, when you stand on the land, you have the propensity to be able to interact with the land on which your feet are standing. So therefore you are poised to be able to change the frequency of the land where you are. And that's what they want me to do this year. Do channeling sessions for groups in, in other countries. So that's what you meant. You were going to do that with the Canadian folks. Yeah. But you're on the same time frame as Canada, aren't you? Well, yeah, yeah you know, three time zones. Same continent. Yeah. Different um, different trauma stored in different places. But <laughs> it, well, exactly, yes. <laughs> but that is of no consequence to the team that I channel. It's like you've got to be standing on the land to do the work. Mm. Well, I, I, I like that you're, you're working with the, the land directly. I've been 
for a couple of months, I've been meditating with this young woman once a week who does sort of coherent peace meditations. And um, I was really, a friend of mine started doing it. I was really interested. I like meditating every week, but I've been watching how she hasn't figured out how to, she presents herself as the one speaking and we're all doing it, but she hasn't figured out how to involve everyone else other than silently. So there's a real limitation on it. Not that I've figured that out exactly either, but, but um, I can see how important that is. It is, it is important to engage everybody. And people say at the end of one of these groups where the, the, the channel information is so clear and so precise and organised step by step that everybody can be part of it. And there's even been people who've monitored the effectiveness of what we've done and recorded that by phone and in other ways as well that they say at the end of the group, you know, we're so grateful to be part of this group. It's such an honour because they know that their frequency, that the signature that they hold as a unique human being is being utilised for this challenge. Mm -hmm. I like the way you put that, that our frequencies are being utilised. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and they remind us over and over again that you think you're a human sitting on a chair, but your essence is galactic and you come from advanced civilizations with an illustrious background. So it takes us out of our humanness into you know, the essence of who we really are because we all a greater in capacity than we give ourselves credit for. I have this new um, guide who's an ab he, he's a wonderful story. I'll tell you the story. Um, my journey group has a sister circle on the other side of the world, which is in Australia. And so we frequently visit them and then sometimes they come with us and and everybody has like one or two people that they interact with, the spirits that they interact with. So I had initially four people and then I had one woman showing up regularly and I greet all my helpers. And then she got pregnant and had this baby who's named Blue. And in, I don't know, five months, Blue got very, very tall, you know, became, just grew really fast. and. Blue is around all the time. Blue is the one who goes into the pyramid with me. Well, Blue is always talking to me about getting bigger. And so I've been practicing because he's so big <laughs> that I get big. <laughs> and it's such a simple concept, but it's exactly what you're talking about. The larger self and, and getting beyond all those. Yeah. Narrow We're not humans sitting in chairs. We have a galactic essence chose to be here at this time without us being here the transformation of this planet wouldn't have happened couldn't have happened so um talk to me about how you perceive all this in terms of co-creating with the universe i mean i know that that's the underlying thing of working with the Guardian Alliance, but just talk about your perspective on that. Well, again, it goes back to the cells because the intuition, when you are in touch with your intuition, whether you call it intuition or, or you know, gut feelings or the, or the number of names that we have for it, each time we raise our vibration, Meg, we bring in a part of ourself that's been waiting to match that vibration. So we bring in a part of ourself on a regular basis, maybe two or three times a year. And that part of ourself is embedded into the whole cellular structure of our body. 
So you might refer to it as a higher self, but we've got numerous. So when that higher self is embedded into the cells, it brings with it a new level of intelligence within each of us. And that level of intelligence holds the God spark that connects us to source. So when we tune in to the intelligence of ourselves, we are instantaneously communicating with our essence that's connected to the universal source. Because we're all, we all hold sparks of God. That's who we are. But the way that we communicate in an easier way is by communicating with the cells of the body that holds that recently downloaded aspect of our self that holds the highest frequency until the next higher frequency comes in. So do you, uh, do you have people reacting to holding sparks of God? You know, they can't do that because God is out here. D does that happen at all? I've never had that conversation with anybody that they disagreed. Because when, when you get all yourselves to a collective yes, everybody feels exactly the same feeling. They describe it in different words. But the feeling of there's lightness, me when I got all the cells of my body to agree that they would work with me, it was like your, your gorgeous American cheerleader teams where they were, you know, rah, 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 we're on board, we're all on board. It was like this amazing exhilaration that I felt. And when you actually experience that, there's no doubt that that greater part of you has just been switched off. I, I, that came up. I, I recently made friends with a woman who's a um, congreg who was a congregational minister and worked in social justice and so on. And uh, we're slowly trying to navigate these different languages. And I think that there's meeting points, but but it's yeah, it takes a while to figure it out. And you'll always find meeting places. Always find meeting places. I'll just unplug this. Even communicating with somebody eye to eye is a communication. So, um, is there anything significant besides the cellular work and the, the intuition that we're talking about um, that you feel like is needed to help shift consciousness and the trajectory of humans? I think it's a new concept to understand that the universe within the human is a replica of the universe outside us. You know, we are a fractal. And source is within us as much as source is outside us. So if we can understand that we are a tiny fractal of a much greater field of intelligence and what you name that intelligence is up to you. then your appreciation of self becomes that being here, just having a physical presence and being on this planet right now is one of the most extraordinary experiences of any lifetime that you will ever have. Yeah, I feel that a lot and I haven't gotten a lot of words around it yet hmm. I think I'm I think uh, I'm guessing I'm held back by 
Hmm. Maybe some my old perceptions or, or just people's, a lot of people are befuddled when you start talking about this stuff. <laughs> And, and they are, they are. It's taken me a long time, Meg, to be able to talk about it like this. <laughs> I guess I, I was I, I was chosen to go through this extre extremely difficult process with my body so that I would actually get it. Mm. And then being able to channel and to, to speak the words that I'm given it's taken me 20 years to own what I've done. Right. It's not instant. I am 70 now. It's taken me 20 years. Yeah, ditto. I think about that a lot. You know, five years ago or longer when I was writing my first book, I was, I was, it was like the first steps into owning my own understanding of the world. And now yeah. I'm like so much further along. And I knew I was then, but I couldn't get it yet. I had to let it sit for a while. Um, the writing is generally a lot easier and I'm a lot more confident because I really get. And I'm, you know, every morning I'm waking up with little insights. <laughs> but you have the advantage of the council to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. They I have have a very broad view. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't let me sit in my complacency either. Mm. So do they give you, does the council give you actual guidance on how to bring this forth, like having people in different countries do the grids? Do they ever help uh, you? With that? Yes. They, how it works is that they see the idea first. You know, we would like you to do this. And then when I come over two or three weeks to a realization that yes, it's quite possible. Then I'll ask her, how, how would how would you like me to do it? And then they'll tell me. And it was yesterday actually that they said it can only be done by the humans that stand on the land. I go, oh, so I can't just beam them in with a Zoom meeting to our Perth at Perth event. And they said, no, no, you can't. So I'm now looking at time time zones and time frames and how best to organize this. Or even to draw the people who know they stand on the land. I mean, a lot of people do. That's a, that's a really good phrase, actually, because a lot of people will resonate with that, even though they might not know all the that's other right. stuff. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I've got clients globally right now, too, who sit in... India, South Africa, Canada, the States. So those people that I've worked with kind of have an inkling of, of what I do. So we'll start with little groups. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many people. You know, three people is a group. And you'd be surprised how potent a small group can be. Hmm. How do these people find you? Usually by word of mouth. Because it's not easy to do a search and like figure out what you're doing. <laughs> you, you can't really search me. I took my website down. Oh, did you? I haven't looked yeah. at it for a long time. Yeah, and um, I'm ready to put up a new one. But I'm told that... Um, until what's occurring in America takes its course, um, there are many people who will be the voices of the, the transition mm. and that I've, I'm to wait. So I'm hoping that February, March might be good. Well, if it, if it transforms that quickly, it, it'll be... Quadruple miracles, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be great. We, we would all appreciate that. I, I was talking to the, the son of a, some dear friends of mine who passed on, who's moved to their house here. And he also lives in Michigan, in Cadillac, Michigan, which is a totally conservative area. And all his friends are Trump supporters. He's a, 
he worked in banking. He's a very good listener. He always seems curious about things. I don't think he remembers stuff, but he's like really listening. So he was talking about some friend and, and going on about how the election was stolen and, you know, all the hoopla that people believe, um, just kind of nodding. I, I failed to ask him, does he ever tell his friend what he thinks? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's pretty exciting. You have enough energy to do all this? I do have the energy to do this. I mean, I think all my energy is directed at this. This is what excites me the most. Right, right. And, and I really think that I've actually almost hit my purpose and what I've come for this lifetime. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a fabulous feeling when that happens, so. It is. It is. And age has nothing to do with it because as our bodies increase in vibration, when the light of a higher vibration codes the body, it's coding it for a generation. And that's quite evident with my body at the moment. I've just been through two or three months where the um, the residual paraplegia in the soles of my feet is reversing, hmm. and that's very exciting. I walked well prior to this, but I walk even better now because I can actually feel the movement inside my feet, which I couldn't before. Hmm. And so with each of these pulses of the coded information, the body is being taught to repair itself beyond what anybody has ever been able to, to achieve. Mm. So I know that I'm here for the long haul and that our lifespans are going to be considerably longer than the ones that our parents and our grandparents had. Well, we often, our pyramid group often laughs, or not often, but occasionally laughs about our promise to live another hundred years. <laughs> I, you know, I feel that too. A huge, I mean, huge amounts of energy, and then also I'm more tired. You know, physical. Oh, phys physical tiredness over last year was something that we all had to manage here hmm. because of the level of regeneration that was happening in our bodies and the level of repair to the fault lines. So if your fault line was physical, it came with a bit of pain. If it was emotional, then you were bringing up past life, well, parts of this life to review and let go of. And so it was debilitating. Everybody was tired. Mm. But that was because the energy generated was going into self-repair. They do promise me that we get past this. <laughs> well, this has like been totally wonderful to both to see you and to to uh, hear your wisdom on all this stuff. Do you have anything else you want to say? Not just to hold your own personal vision of where you personally feel you would like to take your life regardless of the parameters of your know, finance or where is your passion what is it that you have that you would willingly share with others what is it that you can offer that nobody else can and really be true to that because that's where that's how we're going to take ourselves forward into an age which the team I channel describes as a golden age for humanity. Mm. And we're the ones catalyzing that. Mm. It's a huge privilege. It is. I can't 
Of course, imagine living any other time. No, weren't we clever? <laughs> we're all up there somewhere together going, okay, so we're going to be the forward trick. We're going to do the hard work. We're going to bring the frequencies through our body first. And we're going to take those frequencies through our body and we're going to put them into the earth below us. And the frequency will be embedded into the grids that support the land and people who walk the land will pick up our frequency and it's all going to be invisible. And this technology that we've hidden inside ourselves won't be seen until somebody talks about it at the appropriate time. I mean, I think it was the most extraordinary plan of all time to house a frequency generating field inside the human body because no one would look for it there. Hmm. Your doctor friend, does she see some, um, you might have said in the beginning, was she, does she see different uh, geometric shapes or something about that? Each, each different frequency meg has its own geometric um, representation. So yes, those are, those are recorded, she draws them. And one of our network has spent probably five hours a day for 20 years channeling what that does to the human body because the image in the eye, the eye being a hologram for the whole body, that pattern is embedded on the, on the whole body and into every cell. So that frequency of light brings forth a geometric uh, well, they're, they're sacred geometry pieces, really, that are quite vibrant and they, they morph and change. But that's language to the cells of the body. That's, the cells understand the language of ge geometry just as musicians make cymatic from sound light makes cymatic the geometry that the human body knows as a language and can action as a language. That reminds me, I had an interesting thing the other day. What was the context? Um, I think it was when we did our pyramid meditation. Yeah. So, you know, we have the double pyramid, right? Black mm -hmm. thing in the middle. So some things happen in my journey and the, it switched. So the points were together. Oh, total reversal. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was really important, but I haven't figured out what it means yet. <laughs> yeah, that is very important. You're right. Yeah. Mm. I haven't seen it. It was just a few days ago. I haven't seen it again, but I was, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think I think. Uh, well, I started to say things uh, emerged more slowly for me than for you, but that might not be true. It, it's uh, it's a different kind of process. So it, we're here to enact our own process, and and your process different to mine mm. unfolds for you in the same way that mine unfolds for me. We all came with the unique resonance and an innate ability to do what we're all doing and it's an intrinsic part of the whole plan Meg without you that work with the land is forgotten mm. every single one of us here is vital to the plan so one of the really sad things about our sheltering in place for so long is that, you know, I have a medicine wheel and it's a very powerful portal, holds all this light. And, and I've loved over the years bringing people there to experience it. And I never necessarily know what their experience is. I just tell them about it and let it go with that. Except if I'm teaching an ongoing class or something, but um, it's, I visit it but it's really different not having been able to gather people there. And I felt really sad about it. Oh, yes. 
Yes. But there wasn't anything to do <laughs> besides just keep feeding it and wait for something to emerge. And maybe you're empowering it by doing that. Well, I know I have to keep uh, in resonance with it and paying attention. Of course. And that's yes. stronger sometimes than others. Mm -hmm.